Okay. Now, this is our first time to get together for our literature circles and for Reader's Workshop. So I wanted to talk tonight about what we're going to do when we're in a book club or a literature circle. What kind of behaviors are we going to have? How are we going to prepare? How are we going to talk when we're in the circle? So I put a list of things down that I want us to talk about a little bit tonight. The first one is prepare for your group meeting. Do your thinking, get your reading done, and come so that your thinking is really visible so that you can share with others what your thinking was. Another thing, come to the group excited to talk. Write things down in your journal about things you would like to talk with other people about. For example, one of the things I would like to talk about tonight is how do the rest of you feel about traveling clear across the country when it would be really difficult to do in that day and decide to live in a house with a man you've never met who might want you to be his wife and his two kids. Actively participate in the discussion, so you need to be sharing your thinking. You come prepared to talk. This isn't a place for us to sort of hide. We're going to all be sharing and talking. Uh, support your thinking using evidence from the text. If you think that Sarah is going to stay, then what evidence in the text led you to believe that she's going to stay? If you think she's going to leave, what evidence in the text leads you to that conclusion? So that's the kind of thing that you're going to be doing. The more that we get students doing this, the deeper that their understanding goes, and the more they're intrigued with the book. Stay on the topic until it's talked through. So in other words, if one of you comes up tonight with the first question for the group to discuss, we're not going to have someone else going like this after one person talks because they're dying to get their question on the table. We're going to keep those hands down and we're going to continue to talk about that topic until it's talked out. And sometimes I might ask the person who asked the question, do you feel like you've got a good response? And then we're ready for another person to volunteer a question. Make sense? Uh, conversation rules. So in other words, we don't talk over each other. We don't have side conversations going on uh, because that would be rude to the people talking. And on the kids sheet that I have for them, big letters, don't be a talk hog. In other words, there's other people with opinions <laughs> and they want to share also. Making eye contact with the speaker. When we're in group talking about Sarah Plain and Tall tonight, I don't want your eyes on me unless I'm the speaker, okay? You don't need to raise your hand to speak. We'll say that Jamie starts talking and she throws out a question and you want to respond to her. If you're not talking over anybody else, go ahead and respond to her. But all eyes are on her when she's asking the question. All eyes will be on Caleb when she's responding to it. So you're not looking at me. You're really carrying on a real conversation that's not teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student because that stifles our conversations. Making eye contact with the speaker, listen carefully to others. So there's no way that we know how to respond to other people unless we're really listening to what they say. So this is a great opportunity for our children in our classrooms to really begin to listen to one another because how are they gonna know how to respond and carry the conversation further if they're not actually listening to one another? I can print this off for people. I mean, I can put it up on, online. Okay. It's not there yet, but I can. Okay, uh, build on others' ideas at appropriate times. So somebody has thrown out an idea and you take that idea and you think, I can add to that idea. Here's something I'm thinking about that idea. And so you go ahead and build on the idea that someone else has. This is the kind of thing that really deepens our understanding of that book. So what should happen in our literature circles and book clubs is that as we get together and talk, we get a deeper understanding of what's going on in that book. And we, we come to a whole new view of the book. Okay. Um, respect others thinking. You won't always agree with everybody, but you can disagree respectfully. 
you could say, I don't agree with Michelle. I'm going to call you Mindy at some point. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't agree with Michelle because I think da 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 da. And the book says, and that's why I think what I think. So you're going to try to back it up with something from there. You're going to disagree respectfully. Then she may come back and say, well, I thought that because, and she could cite evidence in the book that led her to her conclusion. But that kind of critical thinking makes kids want to be a part of a group. They like that kind of deep thinking. Um, ask questions to clarify meaning of the text or of a vocabulary word that you might not know. Uh, I was doing Island of the Blue Dolphins with a group of students. And if you've read that, you know that Karana leaves the island two different times. And so the student that was in the discussion group just kept asking questions that showed that she was lost. And I couldn't seem to figure out how she was lost in our discussion and it wasn't making any sense to her. And she said, well, I thought when she left that her boat was leaking and she had to come back to the island. She did, that's true. Well, how come then she is not coming back, but she's going off to find her people? Didn't realize that they had left, she had left two times. Very easy to clear up, but you had to get to what was the confusion first. One person talks at a time, and all of us are responsible for asking someone who is quiet to join the conversation. We wouldn't say, Darcy, would you join the conversation? We might say, Darcy, what do you think about that? So we're trying to pull out others. So it's not the teacher's responsibility only to get people to talk. It's all of our responsibility to get our friends to share in the conversation. Come prepared with your materials so you always have your journal and you always have your book. And you may always have something to write down what our next assignment is. Okay. Go deep. Don't just think on the surface. Think below the surface. What's going on in this story? What kinds of things can I be thinking about that will really help me to think deeper and to think more intensely about, for instance, I'm going to throw a question out. Why is it that Caleb is more excited about getting a new mother than Anna? What, what are the reasons that you think might possibly contribute to this difference? You would think Anna would want a new mother more because she has all the responsibilities of cooking and cleaning and doing everything in the house. So what is, what's going on there? Voice level. It's courteous to the students who aren't in the group. So we're going to use quiet voices and we're not going to disturb the kids that are in their own areas reading and maybe writing about what they're reading. We want them to be able to do their thinking while we're doing our thinking. Now the one exception to that is when I have a group that's ready to move into deeper kinds of talking about their books, I will ask a group to come and sit right behind the higher group and let them listen in to the kinds of conversations so they begin to understand how they can talk about books and before too many weeks they can be interchanged with those kids and we can really change up the groups a lot better. And do not inter interrupt book clubs. So in other words, if you have to go to the bathroom for you're sick, you just go. We'll figure it out. Uh, if you don't know what to do next, you probably haven't been in the classroom very long, <laughs> but if you don't know what to do next, there's always a person of the week that you can go to to say, I did this, now what would I need to do? So that you can get some direction before group, and then in between groups, we are always open for conversations with students that have questions. What do you think about those kinds of things as you look at developing um, powerful literature groups. Which ones stick out to you? Um, the first one, prepare for group meeting. Um, we're working on practicing this right now in my class and at least one student every day hasn't done the reading or 
was prepared, what do you do? Oh, that's an easy question to respond to. Um, I typically talk to them privately, and I say to them, I'm sorry, but you can't come to group today. That's what I do. You're not ready. If this happens tomorrow, it's already happened two days, if this happens tomorrow, I'm going to put you in a group that's reading a book that's easier, because I think this might be too hard for you. Most kids don't want that. Most kids want to stay in a book that's appropriate for them. But I, I don't fudge, you know. This is something that we all owe it to each other to come prepared. It's not fair to the others, and it's not fair to you. Right. Because you can't talk. Right. So then do you have them go sit at their desk by themselves and read it while yep. the group goes? Okay. Yes. What I do. <laughs> the other thing you can do is to have them come to the group, but they can't say a word. And for some kids, that's torture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's a torture for me as a kid. So you have to know your students. Okay. If that would be torture, make them come and not say anything. Mm -hmm. Not that you want to torture kids, but you want to do, <laughs> you want to do something that's going to entice <laughs> them. Right. Enticing is more of what I would want to say there. Other things that you've noted, something that might be new to you. You hadn't thought about. I think the build on others' ideas at appropriate times, I think that's a skill that takes some time to develop. Kind of ties in with listening carefully and going deep. So when a student does that for the first time in a group, I might say, Bobby, you know what you just did? Everybody listen up to what you just did because all of us can do this. When she was talking, she was building on Jenna's idea. She was adding to the idea that Jenna had. Good thinkers do that. Good thinkers do that. So I'm going to try to name what they're doing when it first shows up so that they begin to understand what it is we're looking for. I really like the, um, it's not teacher driven, but the conversation should be between the students. Mm -hmm. I really like that mm -hmm. because I feel like that's almost a habit you'll have to break. It is. Mm -hmm. Through this, is they'll really have to get used to, what do you think? Like, because right. they're going to, I feel like they'll instantly look back to me. To they do. Who does she want to call on so that? So do you so mind I really like slowly that. pull, pull no. yourself out? No. I tell them how we're going to do it. And then I look down. <laughs> I refuse to make eye contact. Do you, okay. do you select somebody to start the conversation? I do. I do okay. do that. Okay. Um, but you'll see in just a few moments how we're going to do go about doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you absolutely cannot look up. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, yeah. they are all going to be looking at you. Yeah. We have to break that. And once it's broken, you can you can do full on looking around the, the room because they don't care if you're looking around. They've gotten beyond you. Mm -hmm. And I could have a sub and be gone and know that they're going to have powerful discussions without me there. Matter of fact, I have had subs and the subs have said to me, because I, I would leave a note and say, this group needs to meet today. Just sit with the group. You don't have to do anything because they know what to do. And I always would get copious notes about the powerful discussions that these kids had. And they ran it without her doing one blessed thing. You know, that's what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of classroom you want, that they could almost run it themselves. Because you've modeled and you've created this environment. <laughs> Two questions. Is there an ideal number of students that you have had that work well for a literature circle? And what age would you start trying to do Literature this. circles. Okay, I would start literature circles in first grade with kids who are now able to read from the toad. Okay. And it would be a small literature circle as I'm trying to get them to think, I love cookies. How many of you know cookies from Frog and Toad? Okay, so they bake cookies and they're going to eat one cookie and then, well, they could have another cookie and then they have another cookie and then they say, well, you know, we need to stop eating cookies. We need willpower. And so the question in there is, well, what's willpower? Well, not doing something you really want to do, that's willpower. And so they decide that they could put them in a box. But Toad says, we could open the box. <laughs> and Frog says, well, we can tie the box. And Toad says, but we could untie it and open the box. 
And so Frog gets a ladder and he climbs to the top cupboard and he puts that tied box in the top shelf and he comes back down and Toad says, I can climb the ladder. Yeah, I can climb the ladder. <laughs> and so they bring it down and they have one last cookie and but they need willpower. And finally Frog takes the cookies and throws them out the window and says, come birds. And Toad humps off and he goes home and makes more cookies. <laughs> but it's, kids don't know what willpower is and it's a great, great time to talk to them about it. Have you ever had something you, you knew you weren't supposed to do but you just couldn't stop yourself? And they get really into that kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. So we can start those even in first grade when you have a quality book. You can't start it with some of the books that are written at that level. But Frog and Toad books are just awesome books for critical thinking. And so we start it whenever the kids get up. That's about a level 18 in reading recovery, so okay. K, probably. Right. And um, so they're to the point, you don't have to do hardly anything with teaching them words or anything like that. They're fluent, they have great decoding ability, they have good meaning. And so I start trying to move them into that kind of thinking. Well, they're really ready to go by second grade. And as the year wears on, we get more and more kids in that. I wean those kids that are in Frog and Toad books, I wean them off of one center and have a longer independent reading time for them. And then as they grow, I may wean them off of a second center because by the time our kids got to second grade, we used no centers at all. We had, for our most struggling readers, they could go and listen to books on tape or they could have a book read to them at the computer. Um, they could partner read where someone is reading with them. We had a variety of different things that they could do after they had their 20 minutes of rereading their books. Um, by end of second grade, we should have almost everybody in book clubs. Third grade, only those that maybe have moved, moved new to the district that can't handle it yet, uh, but everybody else is just raring to go. Mm -hmm. no. And they aren't happy if they don't have book clubs. The book that they read, are you letting them read that during their independent time, or are you sending it home? No, not sending it home. Not sending it, okay. Um, if they don't have it done at the end of Reader's Workshop, then they take it home. Okay. Fair. But the idea is you go back and read now, mm -hmm. and you jot down something you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. I don't expect the same kind of rigor in what they write about mm -hmm. at the end of first grade or beginning second but it's still moving that direction. Quick questions. I like the one that says, come to group excited with ideas for discussion, because I think if you're excited about learning, kids get excited about learning. Because mm -hmm. a lot of kids are intimidated in art, and when I always start breaking it down, and I'm excited about the topics, then they're more out to try mm -hmm. than if we're not excited, so. They pick it up from us right off the bat. It's like Lucy Cochran says, what children learn in the first five minutes as they cross the threshold into your classroom in the first day of school. They learn so, so very much. Just the way we're, are we at the door greeting them? Are we welcoming them in? And are we excited about them being here and, and so excited to be their teacher, you know? Do they see books all over the place? Do they begin to realize that, or science, you know, sometimes science is a way into a kid. Do they see things that are going to intrigue them in that area? So again, it's bringing the kids in where this room just vibrates with excitement. Electric. Anything up here that surprises you? Now, I have a small sheet that is like a poster that I created with the students at the beginning of our first book clubs. They didn't see all of this. I do all of this for you as teachers. And I'm going to give them a list of things that we're going to do in book club. And I am through the times that I'm meeting with them going to instill in them the understanding that we do not talk over somebody else. Or, oh wait a minute, when we're in group we don't have side conversations. I'm not going to necessarily put it on a chart. This is too overwhelming for children. Make sense? Mm -hmm. But for us as teachers, this is the core that we really want to begin to establish and to fully establish after we are with them for a while. No questions?
How long do you allot for a book club? I mean, 15, 20 minutes, or um, more? Like for the first grade book club, 15 minutes is usually a great plenty. Mm -hmm. um, when we get up into maybe third, but for sure fourth, fifth, sixth, oh my goodness, they can go on forever. Mm -hmm. So what I need to do is I need to work with them, say 15 to 20 minutes max, if I work with them that long. And then I can say, you guys are having such powerful conversations. I want you to move over here, and I want you to continue your discussion. I need to meet another group, or I need to confer with some kids. So I'm not gonna stop them if they're really having deep conversation. Sometimes, when they move over there, it falls apart. <laughs> Moving from here to there, they've lost all that deep thinking. And if that happens, I'll say, uh, it doesn't sound like we're getting deep thinking. You need to go back and start on your assignment. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if they continue to be passionate about their topic, which often they do, then I let them talk until they're talked out. Because that's what brings them to school. Mm -hmm. They want to talk to each other. They don't want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if I can have them talking in critical thinking ways, then that is really something I want them to do. Okay, before we go on to start our talk on um, Sarah Plain and Tall, if you could focus it over here a minute. This is the um, posters that we had created for us at Maplewood Richmond Heights and laminated, and every classroom teacher had these sets. So we had a wow day. If you call in Lucy Hawkins, they had four categories. We went with three, and I think I gave you a copy, a small copy of this one. And every single day, the students would rate themselves if they were having a wow day, a so-so day, or an oops day. And if they were, if I said they were having an oops day, and they said they were having a wow day, we had a meeting, <laughs> you know? It was just like automatic, and they knew that. So they didn't usually fudge too much from where they really belong. Then this was what we created. So my teacher said to me, Nancy, we love that rubric. Why didn't Lucy create one for writing? I said, guys, we don't need Lucy. Do we need Lucy? Don't you know what you want in writer's workshop? Yeah, we do. So we created it. Wow, I have a plan. I don't know what I'm gonna do during writer's workshop. I can share writing ideas with a partner if I'm brainstorming what to write about. I write the entire time. I use quiet voices. I reread my writing to make sure it makes sense. That's what Evie was doing today. She's been writing a research paper on the Holocaust. And so today she was rereading her research paper. I haven't read it yet, so it'll be interesting to see. Work talk only. That's really purposeful. When I was teaching fifth grade at Clayton, the kids would get together to brainstorm or peer edit, and instead they would say, what boy called you last night? <laughs> and it was, a, it was a social event. So I just put a little tape recorder back there and pushed, pu uh, pushed tape and to copy what they were saying, and then I listened to it on the way home. And I told them what I was doing, and I said, if it's not work talk only, you will lose your privilege of brainstorming with other people or peer editing. That's not what we're about here. It remarkably changed overnight. <laughs> Staying in one place, independently stretching your words and write what you hear. Draft, during drafting, spell the best way I can. We don't say, this is your sloppy copy and you can write any way you want. <clears throat> That's sending a message about spelling <laughs> and handwriting. <laughs> so we say, spell it the best way you can. When you think you're finished, number one, reread. Mm -hmm. Number two, add details to make it more interesting. Number three, make it make sense. Decide if you want to publish it or start a new piece. In writer's workshop, they're not gonna publish everything. They may get through a draft and say, I'm done with this, goes in a holding folder, and they start a new one. Now, if they choose never to, publish something <clears throat> after two or three weeks, we have a conversation that they now need to publish something. Go through what you've written and decide which one of these you're going to publish. Because it's there we get the editing and get the spelling teaching and get the grammar teaching and, 
and get the punctuation teaching that needs to happen. So, so they have difficulty getting a plan, they're not sure what to do. They wrote most of the time. They only use quiet voices some of the time. Work talk, had trouble staying in one spot. Reread when finished drafting, but they didn't make any changes at all. <laughs> Used spelling strategies, did some revision. So that's a so-so day. Oops, off task during shared, was off task during shared writing. Had no plan for writing. Wasted precious writing time. And we always worded that way. How could you waste precious writing time or precious reading time? Off task and maybe pulled others off task. That's doubly bad. Did not reread their work and abandoned and said, I'm done. Relied on others to spell the words, did not revise. So you can see, we had a clear idea of what we wanted students to be doing during writer's workshop. These are not the kinds of things you're gonna really get in a book necessarily, but they are right there where the rubber meets the pavement, kind of nitty gritty, awesome tools to have. And if we have to, you know, they're on the wall all year, but if we have to pull them down and have them on our easel and really go through it again, clearly we do that. Because we're not going to put up with other kinds of things. Questions on those? All right. I think that will be it for tonight. Thank you.